we're going to talk through several things on the process of selling to your tenant. We're going to go over the pros and cons, the process, and how to actually qualify your, your tenant. First off, the pros. It's easy. And ease has a value. Inspections, another pro. You might be able to pass on some inspections. They might, they've been living there for a while. They probably know the condition of the property. You may be able to have an as is sale or maybe fewer repairs to negotiate. I mean, in reality, uh, they might say, Hey, this needs to get fixed. And you say, well, why didn't you ask for it before when you were living here? Obviously you're fine with it, right? It, it's easy. You might be able to not have as many inspections or as much inspection risk. There's no risk of having to pay two mortgages because they're going to just stay living there. So they're paying you rent and then they buy it. So you don't have that dual mortgage risk that you would have when you put your property on the market for sale to a complete stranger because you'd move them out then they stop paying rent. You're going to have to clean it up. I mean, there's at least a month to three months where you might be paying two mortgages, right? Uh, number four, no commissions to pay to people like me. You don't have to pay e agents on either side, listing, buyer's agent, neither side because either neither side is represented. The question you have to ask yourself then is what, what are you going to do with that money? Are you going to give your tenants a deal? Say, hey, we're saving 6% uh, plus some other fees. So uh, I'm going to credit you the the whole 6%, so you end up netting the same with just uh, some more risk? Or do you split the difference? Uh, how does that work? So it's something for you to consider. Uh, number five, good reason, a good pro for selling on to your tenants, no marketing, no showings, no cleaning, no staging, no pre-market preparation. It's all ready to go. Conversely, the cons. First off, when you sell your property on the open market, you have multiple buyers. When you set, when you have great exposure, you get more showings. More showings creates more offers. More offers creates a higher price. If you were able to properly market your property to everybody in the entire world, you can imagine that you are going to find the true market value of the property. When you sell to your tenants, you have one buyer, just one buyer. That's it. So you may not actually find the real price. There's no price discovery through the market process. Second con for selling to your tenants, you have nobody to guide you through the process unless you hire somebody to represent you, somebody like me to help you through that. You don't have a guy. You may not know the local laws. Uh, does that mean that you're susceptible to legal risk? I mean, there are some disclosures and things that you have to accomplish and do that even though you're not licensed, you still have to accomplish. And even though you go to a lawyer and have them help you with the, the closing or title company, they may not actually make sure that you've done that. Uh, number four con is sometimes tenants, they're just not honest with us or themselves about whether or not they can actually buy or whether they really want to buy or not. Frequently, owners in uh, your scenario are kind of led on by the tenants where they say, yeah, we would love to buy the property. And in reality, they don't qualify. They don't have the funding to get to closing. You name it. They, they are not maybe honest with themselves of whether they can or will or want to qualify to own the property. So those are the pros and the cons. Let's talk about the process. First, getting the contract. So one, you got to ask for the deal. You got to ask them what, if they want to do it and get to a yes and get them to, to commit to it. You have to set a price with your tenants and agree to it. Set a date to close. You want to do that 30 days or more in the future. And you want to set a date for them to have that pre-approval letter and show you proof of funds to get to closing. And I would say that you want to do that no more than three to five days in the future. So, you know, you're, you're saying, hey, today uh, is the first of the month. We want to close in the first and then the next month. I want to see a pre-approval letter from a lender. And I want to see a proof of funds in your bank account that say that, yes, you can you have the amount of funds needed to close on this property before we even continue. Because if they don't have the proof of funds and they don't qualify, you wanna know that ahead of time before you start going through the process of of working on a contract or, or talking with attorneys or things like that. You wanna make sure that this is real, right? All right, so, um, so we wanna set a date to have them give you a pre-approval letter, give them proof of funds, you want to set the price, set a closing date. You want to get it all in writing with a nice contract and then get it to a lawyer or a title company to walk you through the process. All right, so let's talk about setting the price. First off, there are several ways that you can set the price. Many people in your scenario say, I need an appraisal. Well, what is an appraisal? That is a person who is licensed by the state of Virginia to go out and set a uh, valuation price for a bank or lender or a homeowner, whatever the case is, to say, this is what I believe the market price is for this property. And that's based on recent market conditions, current market conditions, updates on the home. Is it in great shape? And it's all an opinion. If you have three different appraisers come out, you're going to get three different prices. It's not an end all be all. It is not a fact. You can't stick a line in the sand and say, this is the price because the appraiser said so. Or, That's his opinion of the market. And remember, what does an appraiser do? An appraiser is normally there to represent the bank. So the bank can say, yes, 
I have an independent third party that says that this is the value of the property. So if I have to foreclose on that buyer, that I'm going to be able to get my money back out when I sell it on the market. You could go to an online source like uh, Zillow and get a Zestimate. Boom, it pops right there. There are hazards with Zestimate. They are really good. If you looked at the, if you're into math and statistics, you can look at the statistical model of how they do it and say it is 68% of the time they're within one standard deviation of the price. You know, it's, they go through this whole uh, statistical model of what how they do pricing. The one thing I would caution you with is that once, a, if you were to take your property and put it listed for sale through me on the MLS, the Zestimate will, as soon as the Zillow sees it, they will automatically update this estimate to within a few hundred bucks of what the list price is. So you got to one question whether, you know, how accurate is it really? And that's the same of any online model. You can go to another home valuation model like I have on my website uh, or HomeBot or something like that. And it's going to be a computer that just runs through it. And I can tell you, I think your home is worth X based on the computer model. That's bedrooms, bathrooms, location, square footage. And it just says, hey, this is what I think it's worth. Is that accurate? Maybe, maybe not. Just be cautious. The best way well, and then uh, the fourth way, not the best way, the fourth way is tax assessed value. So the city taxes you on your home prop or your property based on the taxes and frequently the assessed value tends to be lower than the market value, except in a falling market where it tends to be high. Point is the tax assessed value is not necessarily the price that the home is worth. And then the last way and the best way is the way that we determine the price of a property is through comparable sales in the neighborhood. And we just look at everything that's sold lately and compare the actual condition, the updates of the home and say, that's what we should set it for. That's what we're gonna market it for. And that's what we should expect for a final price. The next one is we need to figure out, are the buyers for real? Are they really gonna qualify? So first, Assets and income. Do they have the assets, the cash on hand to qualify for the loan? Do they have the income to qualify for the payments? Is their debt to income ratio sufficient for them to qualify for the loan? Because if it's not, you know, you're wasting your time. You should really get on the market and go find an actual buyer who's going to close. Uh, you need to ask, who are they choosing for a lender? If they're using a big giant national bank, that can be okay. I always recommend a local lender. Uh, and I have several that we use that they tend to be a little bit better. So we had talked about, uh, do they have the debt to income ratio in order to qualify for the loan? Meaning, do they have, compare their credit card debt, to other mortgage, car, car payments, uh, unsecured debt, secured debt, compare that to their income. What is that percentage? Do they qualify? Look at their credit history. That's more than just the credit score. That's bankruptcy history, rental payment history, eviction history. All that stuff is part of their credit history. Most importantly, do they have the down payment required to qualify for this mortgage? Now, if they're a VA buyer, they might not need any cash for down payment, but they're still going to have closing costs. And that could be anywhere from three to 5% of the home price. So a $300,000 home even for a VA buyer is looking for somewhere between five, seven, even $10,000 in closing costs, depending on the scenario. Now, um, if they're a non-VA buyer and they're a conventional, they could be anywhere from three to 20% down payment or an FHA, three and a half percent or higher. So yeah, uh, for the example of a $300,000 property, you know, you could be looking at $20,000 in, in uh, cash that they need to bring to the closing table. That's quite a lot, quite a lot. So do they have that cash? on hand that they can bring within 30 days? It's a good question, right? Do they have the debt to income? Do they have the credit history? Do they have the cash on hand? Boom, that's where, that, if they they have that, they can you can go ahead and sign it and start moving towards cl uh, close. The contract to close process, uh, we actually hire people uh, on our team to manage that for us because it is rather complicated working with title company, inspectors, appraisals, and appraisers and things like that. Uh, that is a bit of a process, but you can certainly manage that on your own. Some things you need to think about is who's going to manage that transaction for you if it's not you, who's going to be coordinated with the title company and the other the, uh, the other players in the transaction, who's going to handle the inspections, who's going to be there to let them in, who's going to manage times and access. Same with the appraisal. And uh, if the appraiser says, hey, it doesn't come in in value, who's going to be talking with the appraiser and essentially arguing with him or her to figure out, hey, this is the number that it needs to come in at. Uh, the another thing to consider, condo and homeowners association documents. If you have a property in a condo or homeowners association, you need to get those ordered. And remember that as a seller, that's typically going to be on you. It could be a couple hundred bucks from the condo or HOA for them to provide that information to you. And the title company is going to want that. And that condo HOA can frequently take two weeks in order to provide them. There's a whole bunch of Virginia law that talks about what how that is handled. So that's something that, that's for another discussion altogether. Once you get through that whole process, you get to closing, you know, there's a few things to consider. First off, passing the keys, piece of cake, not an issue. They already got a key. Your tenant's already there. How about recording the deed? The title company or the attorney, they take care of that. They're going to 
be happy to charge you for it. And as far as transferring utilities, you don't have to worry about that because guess what? They're already paying those. It's all done. So there we are. So that's the process of selling to your tenant. The most important thing there is actually qualifying them. Are they actual for actually qualified? Are they for real? Can they really afford to buy the house? And then we talk through some pros and cons. So that's the process. If you have any other questions on that, please give me a call. Talk to you later.